You can drink the water. Okay, I just didn't want people to, <laughs> to open on a swig, but I'm actually... That's okay. We'll show the part. book as you... Uh, it's uh, mm. Evian water. It's Evian water. Um, Letters to a young contrarian. Why'd you write the book? By all means, yeah, wave it more. Um, well, um, actually, I wrote it because I was invited to. Um, some of your uh, viewers, maybe you too, um, were given when they were young, I'm sure, Letters to a Young Poet by Rainer Maria Rilke, the great German a poet who received these touching letters from a young man who wondered if the poetic life could be lived or was worth leading, and he replied. And it's an exquisite little book, um, putting one's own efforts rather in the shade, but the, the idea of uh, Perseus books was to see if we could do this again. So, for example, um, you'll be thrilled to hear uh, Jesse Norman has written letters to a young diva, advice you know, to someone who might want to emulate her. Um, this letters to a young lawyer, I believe, and then for me, for those who are vaguely malcontented and might want to transfer their discontent into some sort of energy or perhaps into writing. So very tentatively, uh, because it marks my definite accession into middle age, you don't get asked to write for the young unless you've become old. Uh, you have to face it. Um, I, I write to, actually, the people I write to are real. Um, they're my students at the New School in New York, where I teach part-time, and other students I've had in Berkeley and other places. So I always have someone in mind who's actually asked me a specific question. One of the people you write about, Bakal Havel, why'd you include him in the book, and uh, who is he, for those who are not familiar with him? Václav Havel is the president now of the Czech Republic, and he was the president of, of Czechoslovakia before it, it uh, defederated itself. Um, when it became again a free country in 1989 with the collapse of the Berlin Wall and of the, the Stalinist system. And um, the reason why I, I take him as an exemplary case is that he's a man who organized a, a massive national and civic resistance completely non-violently, completely successfully, just by writing and writing ironically and teasingly about the self-evident absurdity of the system he was living under and incredibly it just fell down you know and it was brought down basically I mean it's exaggerating slightly and it's a, it's a it's a vaguely romantic way of putting it but it's not really untrue it was brought down by poets and playwrights and essayists and um, and authors um, so the way that he lived that life and made uh, words into weapons um, has always struck me as a absolutely fabulous 20th century story. Christopher Hitchens will be with us till the top of the hour. Our phone lines are open. They are divided regionally. And if you're watching us overseas or in Mexico and Canada, 202-628-0205. You refer to a man by the name of Santiago Alvarez, uh, who you describe as the grand old man of Cuban, Cuba cinema. Mm. Film was the special medium of the Cuban revolution. And as he assured us was unfettered, completely unfettered. Well, he said with a slight laugh, there is one thing that is not done. No satirical portrayal of the leader will be permitted, referring to Fidel Castro. Yeah. I said quite simply that if the main subject of Castro was off limits then, in effect, there could be no real satire or criticism at all. I'm by the way, I'm today. incredibly touched that you've got underlinings and notes in the margin and so I've, on. I've read it. Thank you. And it's, you'll agree, it's, it's quite short and it's very reasonably priced and very nicely packaged. The perfect Thanksgiving and Hanukkah gift. I'll only have to say this once now. We'll keep showing the book. Um, I want to ask you about the photograph, too. On about, the cover. Uh, yes, Santiago Alvarez, um, who I believe is still with us, uh, is the, was the author of a lot of very punchy, colorful, polemical uh, Cuban films in the early 60s, the time when Cuba was uh, considered a very exciting uh, place, not, and not just on the left. Um, and where a, a large number of very, very good film directors were then more or less free to work. Anyway, I, I went to Cuba in 1968 um, as a young leftist. And I was very interested to see if their claim was true. The Cuban claim was, our revolution is not going to be like Mao Zedong or Stalin. It's going to be different. It won't, it won't end up a kind of grey conformist um, regime. So a lot of us were excited at the thought this could, could be true. And I, what I'm writing about here for my younger audience is, you know, what, what to do when you encounter disillusionment, in a sense. We had, a, we had I was very thrilled, was invited to a seminar with Santiago Alvarez, whose films I'd seen. And he's, I said, well, you know, 
talk more about it, and then he said, well, we're very free here, it was very unfettered, uh, there's only one limitation, you know, you don't make jokes about the leader. And I said, well, the, Mr. Castro seems to be a kind of big factor in this revolution, so if you're leaving him out, he, he's off limits. That's not a detail, is it? And people began to look at me as if I was being um, uncooperative or, you know, disloyal. Um, and it was a sort of early warning to me. Because unfortunately now, I mean, the Cuban cinema, there is, there is still a Havana Film Festival, people do still go to it. But all the life and colour has gone out of Cuban cinema and indeed of the Cuban Revolution. It's as a, a you, tragedy. As you, as you well know, there's a meeting going on today with uh, Carl Rove, the senior advisor to the president, and some of Hollywood's executives. Mm. What role do you think Hollywood can play in what we're seeing in Afghanistan and elsewhere in the world? Good grief. Um, none, I hope. Um, I'd like to think I have an answer to any question you could possibly ask me. I haven't thought about this one, but I, I can't think that Hollywood can be much help either way. Well, let me go back to your words and then we'll open it up to calls. You conclude your book by saying, and this may summarize the essence of the book, the high ambition therefore seems to me to be this, that one should strive to combine the maximum of impatience with the maximum of skepticism, the maximum of hatred, of injustice uh, and irrationality with the maximum of ironic self-criticism. This would mean really deciding to learn from history rather than invoking it. No. It's not bad. It's quite, quite well put. So what's the message? Well, the message is to try and live your life as if um, you were a free person, um, that you didn't have to wonder what anyone else's opinion was, um, that you were, that you should take the risk of believing that if you're the only person who thinks what you think, that that still might well mean that you were right. In fact, though that loneliness often makes people wonder because perhaps out of modesty they feel, well, if I feel this way and everyone else doesn't, maybe I'm crazy or maybe I'm, maybe there's something they know that I don't. I'm trying to encourage people not to think like that. Um, you, you'll notice sometimes on chat shows, I'm sure, and call-in shows as well, people will often say, well, as so-and-so was just saying, and as I, you know, I quite agree, and um, they're nervous, they don't want to speak in their own voice, they won't ever quite come out and say, this is what I think. What I'm trying to give people the, the um, confidence to do, in other words, is to not only think that even if you're the only one who thinks it, it could be true, but to imagine that actually, if, if the majority thinks one thing, it's more likely than not to be wrong. Where was the picture taken? The picture was taken in a studio in Georgetown earlier this year, uh, just by the canal. And how many packs of cigarettes do you smoke? Oh, it's a shameful admission. It depends on how long the day is, really. I mean, if I have a long day, I can go to three packs, which is, you know, it'll, it'll kill me. Um, I don't put advice to the young of any other kind in my book, but if there's anyone watching who is young who does smoke, if they can stop now, they really ought to try. Would you if you could? Or sure, have you tried to quit? I, I, I would. I think temperamentally probably I'm meant to do it. I mean, some people are, and some writers, I think, have a relationship with both alcohol and nicotine that's creative destructive, um, but it's somehow, it's part of one's curse. Um, I'm, I'm one of those. I can also handle it, but, um, but anyway. I mean, we must, mustn't get too pious and depressing on a Sunday morning, but if, any, and if anyone's thinking of taking it up, definitely don't. Detroit, good morning for Christopher Hitchens. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Um, I have a son who I spent an hour on the phone with yesterday arguing about what's going to happen to the world, and he is probably personifying a lot of that last paragraph. Oh. Um, and I wanted to know, really get on to this. He says that the crux of the situation is that no one has any ethics any, anymore and that evil is going to beat good and no matter how much we try although he's very much in favor of fighting injustice and inequality and a very liberal person, he's got a real defeatist attitude right now. He's 23, mm -hmm. he's in medical school and I think he kind of personifies the younger generation right now, and I'm very worried. Well, don't give up. Um, don't give up so easily, for one thing, and, and for sure don't give up on your own son. Um, let me see if I can encourage him, and perhaps you. Um, I'm presuming that by evil and good you are, you're referring to the current clash, okay? I'll make that assumption. Um, this may sound uh, awful, but I, I found a certain sense of exhilaration on September the 11th, which has not left me since. I thought, now here, if you want it, 
is the enemy in absolutely plain view. All the things I write about in my book, intolerance, racism, stupidity, religious cultism, the refusal to think, the refusal to allow skepticism, the, the denial of reason, the, there it all is, it perfectly embodied and symbolized with its consequences, which, and its means are its ends. In other words, civilian murder, filthy murderous attack on civil society is inscribed in the means and the ends. The means are dead bodies. They use, they use civilians to kill civilians, if you follow me, if you, if you can imagine the conditions on those planes in the last minutes. Right, I thought, okay, now I absolutely know what side I'm on. I don't need the president to tell me, and I hope very few people did. I've since then been to Pakistan, because I thought I'd better have a look. I've been to the Afghan front, because I thought I ought to. I've been to Kashmir, where I think the next war will be if we're not careful about it. And I've come to the following conclusion. Mr. Bin Laden made an absolutely horrific mistake uh, when he did what he did. Uh, it's horrific in every other sense, too, obviously, as I've just said. But what he has done is now called for a holy war against the Jews, against the Christians, against, naturally, the secular world, people like myself, against quite a lot of other Muslims, and now, not, not many people have noticed this, against Hinduism as well. In other words, he's just made a billion enemies in India. Furthermore, by doing what he did, he derailed something that was happening in Pakistan, a very horrible thing that was happening there. Sorry to keep using the word horrible. But I would, I would say, quite soberly, that within a year, maybe less, if the World Trade Center had not been destroyed and the other atrocities in Washington and Pennsylvania had not occurred, uh, the Taliban and its allies, including al-Qaeda, would have taken over Pakistan. Pakistan was being very rapidly Talibanized through its military oligarchy and the religious parties and um, uh, Muslim jihad groups it's been sponsoring. They won't get hold of the Pakistani state now. They won't. Uh, and they won't get hold of its nuclear weapons, which they were hoping to do. Um, and you hear all the time that there's a lot of Muslim opinion that favors Mr. Bin Laden and thinks of him as a hero. But what can he do for them? They can't go and join him in his cave, even if they want to. They can't go back to the 15th century with him or live in the desert with him either. Um, what he demands of them is literally impossible. So there's absolutely no chance that he can win. I mean, you can exclude the possibility of the victory of evil. It cannot happen. And I think it might be, we might make some quite good friends uh, in, the, in the battle against it. I would particularly recommend making a friend of the secular pluralist democracy of India which has long been far too low on the United States a list of um, countries to be uh, well connected with. I think we look forward very much to cooperating with India um, and, uh, and, and repudiating tribalism, communalism as the Indians call uh, religious sectarianism. And um, uh, so, you know, I get up every morning thinking, what can I do today to uh, join the battle for and extend the battle for secular pluralist democracy and to inconvenience and humiliate its foes. Our guest, Christopher Hitchens, who's also a contributing editor for this publication, Vanity Fair. This is what the December issue looks like. And inside, he writes, For Patriots Dream, for Patriot Dreams, based on what the caller just brought up. We'll get a call from Dublin, Ireland. Go ahead, please. Hello. Um, I'd like to um, say to Mr. Hitchens, I enjoy his uh, work very much. That's, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I was wondering how you um, look on Mr. Clinton's, uh, President Clinton's um, administration being somewhat asleep at the wheel with regard to bin Laden. I mean, it wasn't the first time bin Laden was struck. No, indeed. What do you think uh, was his fault? Well, um, I can refer you to a chapter in my book about Mr. Clinton, which uh, the book is called um, No One Left to Lie To, in case, in case you wonder what I think about him in general. What I think about him in particular in this chapter, which is called Clinton's War Crimes, is that um, he did one of, the, one of the worst things any president has ever done. He used American cruise missiles in a covert and surreptitious uh, decision that was taken against the advice of most of his joint chiefs and his intelligence chiefs and diplomats, um, ostensibly to bomb a terrorist facility, as they call it, in Sudan, but actually in order to try and fool around with public opinion on the day that Monica Lewinsky was going back to the grand jury. It was, as we say in Washington, a wag the dog moment. He, he picked a target, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he picked a target which he knew 
was not a military facility, that was actually the factory making most of the pharmaceuticals and medicines for Sudan, um, gravely damaging the fabric of that society. He shot another couple of missiles into what he thought was Afghanistan, in fact one of them landed in Pakistan, accidentally revealing the connection between the Pakistani army and bin Laden because the missiles killed a couple of Pakistani officers who had no business being in a bin Laden camp but were, were training infiltrators for Kashmir. And having made a complete fool of himself, having been exposed before the United Nations as having hit the wrong target for the wrong reasons in a shady week where he was trying to avoid impeachment, uh, he dropped the subject of bin Laden altogether. It was a photo op moment for him, it failed. He, he, he then went on to, to basically ignore the whole question, even though a great deal more was accidentally disclosed about this network and what it had in mind for us. So, Los Angeles, good morning. I'm sorry. As with everything else about his pre presidency, it wasn't just eight years wasted. It was, it was eight years we really ought to try and have back. It, it, it was the, most, the most deplorable presidency possible. Los Angeles, go ahead, please. Hi, thanks for taking the call. Good morning. Um, I do have a question for Mr. Hitchens, but I'm curious. Did you not write a book recently about uh, Henry Kissinger? I did. Okay. Thanks and, uh, for everyone mentioning all my other books. I'm thrilled. How it's called The Trial of Henry Kissinger. It argues that Henry Kissinger can and should be brought within the ambit of law for crimes against uh, humanity and war crimes. How many books have you written? In my life. I, about 12 or, or so, 12 or 13. Actually, it may sound conceited. I don't know. Um, and some of them are pamphlets, really, rather than books. I mean, the, the full-length proper books, about three. Collections of essays or short subject books, maybe about another five or six. Go ahead, caller. Thanks for thank your <coughs> patience. Sure. Um, I guess the, the, it's such a huge subject, and there's so many things that one would like to say, and time is so short. But uh, I guess briefly in answer to Daniel Pipe's question about what could we do for moderates, um, I think what we could do is pay them. I think it seems uh, worldwide there's this struggle between labor and people in power, and it doesn't really matter what religion, what nationality, what age, you know, what uh, time in, in human history, it's, it's always there. And when we pay workers well, they're pretty happy and we get along harmoniously. And when we find we can't pay workers well, there's plenty of trouble. And the people in power will do anything and everything, including sending missiles and bombs, to stay in power and to keep things the way they are generally. But my question for Mr. Hitchens is, with all this talk about uh, pr prosecuting perpetrators of terrorist acts, don't we have a history in this country of uh, ha writing instruction manuals on terrorism and distributing them in Central America? And if that's true, or if any of these types of things are true, don't we have people in our own country like Oliver North that we should be prosecuting? Thanks, caller. Well, it is regrettably true uh, that there was a manual on, on terrorism and subversion and um, assassination and all of that that was distributed by, um, not by, let's be fair, not by this country. Uh, you can't say the United States did this because Congress was not told about it. Uh, so um, they, the people who did it thought highly enough of the American people at least to have the grace to lie to them about this. But it is true that such a manual was circulated and given to criminal elements in Nicaragua um, with instructions to proceed to try and destroy the society. And it's further true, I believe, and I think I could prove if, if challenged, that at the so-called School of the Americas, the training school um, that the United States government runs for South America and Central America, which has produced uh, p people like General Noriega as its graduates, um, methods of, of torture and um, kidnap and assassination and disappearance were, were inculcated on our dime into these revolting military elites upon which American policies depended for far too long. So yeah, that's undoubtedly true. And the, the case I make against Henry Kissinger, which is a much broader one than that, is that ever since the arrest of General Pinochet in London, We've entered a new world where there is such a thing, the, the common phrase for it now, the legal phrase is u universal jurisdiction. The war criminal and the, um, I find the word terrorist a bit vague, but let's use it for now. People like that are defined in law as the common enemies of humanity. They may be arrested and put on trial wherever they are found. And sovereign immunity, the claim that some of them make that, well, what they did, they did as politicians or as legally appointed uh, public servants is 
false will be struck down by a court. That's not a defense for committing crimes of torture, murder, kidnap, and the rest of it. So I think it's excellent. I mean, uh, Mr. Pinochet is on his way um, to jail. He won't go, actually, because the Chileans are very forgiving, and he will, he's successfully pleaded mental uh, disorder. But he's, you know, he's ended his days indicted. I think possibly General um, Su uh, Suharto of Indonesia will go the same way. Henry Kissinger was hit, on, oddly enough, on the 10th of September this year in Washington, D.C., in a federal court with a suit which will be found to have standing uh, by the relatives of, of a Chilean officer who he had murdered in uh, Santiago in 1970. It's taken a long time to catch up with him, but the law has a long arm and a long memory. What was your travel route to Pakistan and Afghanistan? Well, actually, I had, it was an odd dogleg route because I, I had a, an appointment in Calcutta that I had to keep first with a, a brilliant photographer called Sebastian Salgado, who I'm sure some of your audience know. He's a wonderful, <coughs> excuse me, wonderful Brazilian photographer. He's, he's basically photographed the third world. He's done exploitation of labor, rape of natural resources, refugees, migrants, war, five or six major albums of work. And he's now the World Health Organization's, um, do excuse me, <coughs> envoy, ambassador, for the eradication of polio, which you'll be glad to hear is nearly done now. By 2004, probably most countries will report in that polio has gone. And West Bengal is one of the places where that's been fought for the hardest. And I went with the Vanity Fair with him. We're going to do a big portfolio of his pictures on the struggle against polio. And it was a real honor to go around Calcutta with, um, with such a guy. So when I'd done that, I, I rushed off via New Delhi to Islamabad. And then did you drive to the Afghan border? I did. What was Actually, that like? uh, well, to the, uh, <clears throat> I, I got someone to do that for me because I felt I needed someone who spoke um, Pashtun. How long did it take? Oh, from Islamabad to Peshawar, is, it takes you about three hours, I would say. It's very near, frighteningly near in some ways. And when you're in Peshawar, you're in, in some ways, you're in Afghanistan. It's, in some, it's an Afghan town. That border is very wobbly line uh, drawn, as you know. And it, it's full of Afghan refugees. Um, very, very tense atmosphere at the moment. And you went, is it uh, Balliol College I in did. Oxford? Yes. How many colleges comprise Oxford? I think it's about 23. Um, uh, the, there's no such thing as a campus as such in Oxford. It's just a, around the middle of the town, which is a wonderful old medieval city. Um, there are about, yeah, I would say now it's, uh, it's above two dozen. Um, walled-in, enclosed buildings, cloistered buildings, each of them self-governing. So you can't, there's no such place as Oxford University, really. Um, it's a mystery. I, we used to laugh, it was a favorite thing, joke actually about American tourists, I'm sorry to say, when I was a kid. You, you'd meet someone looking very stranded, wearing Bermuda shorts, asking directions for the university, and you say, well, I can't help you. But you can come and have tea in my college if you like. Our next call is from Oxford. This England. is how we make people feel at home, you see. <laughs> Go ahead, caller. How many colleges? How many colleges at Oxford? Is it 23? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. I thought it was 27, actually. Fair enough. Well, there, there are a couple of new ones since I was there. Okay. And of course uh, now, um, girls uh, can share in all this too. Including uh, was, Chelsea Clinton. Indeed. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry, caller. No, that's okay. I was at a meeting of the Oxford University Historical Society at Bowie all the other night, Chris, no. just, just to make you feel at home. Very right. much so. And um, I, I very much appreciate your writing, especially in Vanity Fair and the other work that goes on in that magazine, which is very good. Thank you. And I, I do wonder a little bit about the current crisis, whether I very much agree that this is a, an issue of the secular enlightenment versus various sorts of fundamentalism. And I'm wondering against that background whether at least part of the problem is not the widespread cynicism in the world about the United States and the role of moral leadership being given effect that, you know, President Bush is trying to give that moral leadership, so are other people in America. Um, but that's undermined consistently by the sorts of issues that you've discussed already, the U.S. policies in South America, Latin America, and other parts of the world. And um, isn't it the case that to align this, the United States has to um, bring, join in with the internationalization of justice and, and become a full participant in all of those activities, including the bringing to justice of war criminals and the identification of the dead hand of corporations involved in bringing about war? and so on. 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not completely out of sympathy with what you say, and I know what I know exactly what you mean by what you say as well. Um, but here's what I think: if there was to be a list of the top ten uh, scribblers working in Washington, um, the top ten critics of U.S. foreign policy, I would hope to have made that list by now. If I w didn't make it, I would feel bad. And if I was told I was on the top ten, I'd feel I'd come by it honestly. And I think some people watching know what I mean by that. I would, I would yield to nobody, um, and that's what I meant when I wrote the Kissinger book. But I don't think, in some sense, I don't think this has anything to do with that. The Al-Qaeda attack was not on that. The Al-Qaeda attack was directly on American civil society. The Al-Qaeda people are trying to impose fascism on the Muslim world, have succeeded in imposing it in one country already. They hope to win their argument in the Muslim world by bringing it to the streets of the West. This is an unbelievably fierce challenge, therefore. As I said earlier, it's impossible for it to succeed, but it can do a great deal of damage meanwhile. Therefore, whether President Bush says he's against it or not should be irrelevant to you or to me. So the question is, how against it are you? What are you going to do about it? I think to start the argument by clearing the throat and taking a step back and say, well, let's first deconstruct American foreign policy would be, a, would be a, an error. I mean, those arguments go on anyway. They'll have to go on anyway. I'm not going to change my side on any of them. But it's, it's, the question is, do you recognize this as a challenge to yourself, to your own society? Uh, do you feel solidarity with the other societies that are being mauled and uh, profaned by this kind of theocratic fascism? And if so, what are you doing to help them out and, and build um, and intensify that solidarity? This is our guest's latest book. It's called The Art of Mentoring, Letters to a Young Contrarian, dedicated to the memory of Peter Sedgwick. Who is he? Peter Sedgwick was a man I met just as I was going to Oxford. Um, he was a teacher there, um, uh, very, not a very well-known author uh, outside his field, which was actually psychiatry, and the relationship of psychiatry to, to politics. Um, and I just, I met him when I was about, I must have been 17 or 18, at a meeting since we're staying with that, the old town. It was in actually an Oxford town hall. It was a rally against the atrocious um, war in Vietnam. And I asked a question to some communist speaker, a hostile question. And at the end of the meeting, this man came up to me and said, I thought that was a good argument you had and blah, blah. And, uh, anyway. We became friends, and when I went away to teach, which was not long after that, um, while I was waiting to go to Oxford, I, I taught in a boys' school down in the Western Peninsula in Devonshire. And we began to correspond. And um, he, he was very good. He answered all my letters. He sent me books he thought I should read. He introduced me to all kinds of uh, subjects I'd been unaware of. So I always, when people ask me for advice or if I have a student, who would like some of my time outside class, I always try to do it. And I always try and think that it's paying back Peter, who, alas, is no longer with us. He died appallingly young and in a very pointless way. Next call is Geneva, Switzerland. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I'm a big fan of yours. Yeah. Uh, and um, what can I say? Uh, just because your honesty, uh, your, your, your relative uh, your own clear thought uh, and honesty as opposed to the dancing. Uh, and my question is about the dancing, because uh, it's just now that we're getting a sense of what the Al Jazeera network might be like, and I'm wondering about its funding and economics, and I'm wondering about uh, the balance that CNN may or may not provide in the Muslim world uh, for information and whether or not it makes sense to set up something like an infomercial type 24-hour news broadcast so that uh, Arabs can actually hear other Arabs and get other information and points of view that are bent towards uh, specifically giving them the information. I know they're working on, they're already doing radio, but obviously visual whenever it's opportune is always more impacting. And, you know, the uh, infomercials, the, the, the mild distortions, you know, are uh, only of, you know, the mild distortions are only mild in many respects. I'll stop you there. Thanks for the call. Well, I, 
I didn't think there was any mystery about the financing of Al Jazeera. I thought we knew that it was the Sultan of Qatar who put up the dough. Isn't that correct? And um, it's not. I don't know if that's um, sinister or or not. I mean, there seems nothing co covert about it. In any case, nothing surreptitious. Um, I, I saw a very interesting discussion involving my friend Robert Fisk, who's one of the best of the Middle Eastern reporters, if not the best, and uh, some other participants. Uh, I think this was actually on the BBC World Channel, which isn't bad. And what Fisk said, um, this was at a time when there was talk of, you know, not letting Al Jazeera broadcast just straight to us with Mr. Bin Laden's remarks. Fisk said, well, the thing is this, um, he, he's met, Fisk has met Bin Laden more than anyone else, I believe. So when he meets Bin Laden, he asks him a, lo a lot of questions. He doesn't just say, have you got any remarks I can c carry away with me and put in my newspaper so that your words get to the rest of the world. He's not a megaphone. He's not a ventriloquist dummy. Um, and Jazeera does do that, or has been doing that. Uh, whereas when they interview Tony Blair, say, or anyone else, they quite rightly ask him a lot of tough questions. So what they need to do is become a, a great deal more journalistic. And, and combative, and uh, they have to do the job of asking questions. They can't just be a megaphone. Next call, Philadelphia for Christopher Hitchens. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. My question, my question is, the uh, attack on the World Trade Center in many ways was uh, another Pearl Harbor. It was a sneak attack. There had been many indications before that actual actions uh, over the intervening 30 years where Americans have been attacked generally overseas. My question is, do you reckon that it will always be a Pearl Harbor type of action, World Trade Center kind of action that uh, is required in future to rouse this country to really address issues? Is this the nature of democracy? Thanks, caller. And if I could pick up as a segue to what you write in Vanity, Vanity Fair, which is, more than I worry about flag waving, I worry about what will happen when the flag waving has to stop. All these ceremonies of emotion from children's drawings to fun drives mm. are prone to diminishing returns. A time will come when fewer taxis fly the stars and stripes, and it could be just at that point that another awful wound is inflicted by covert and nefarious enemies. Covert and nefarious enemies. Yeah, I do worry about that. I also say in that piece that I think Pearl Harbor is the least useful comparison. I'm sorry to disagree with you, sir. Um, Pearl Harbor was something that could have been and was predicted, not not the day or the timing, but it was understood that the United States and Japan were maneuvering for an advantage in the Pacific where the, the empires were going to clash and the, probably the first clash would be naval. Um, the Japanese found a, a brilliant way of finessing that, to their, at least to their opening advantage, and they used their own uniformed uh, flyers, losing many of them in the process, to attack a strictly military base. Now, it's a, very underhand, admittedly, but it was yeah, within the rules of imperial and imperialistic warfare, by no means the worst thing that's ever been done. Um, by contrast, the forces of Al-Qaeda use, use civilians as missiles to kill civilians. And if they had succeeded um, in what they might have had in mind, I believe they could have had in mind in, in New York, which all you have to imagine is that, that those planes hit, went sharking into the buildings, only perhaps half an hour later, which is given you know what takeoff times are like at Logan Airport in New Jersey, as anyone who's tried it knows, wouldn't have been at all unthinkable. You could have factored that in. The buildings could have been nearly full. That's 50,000 people, as far as the attackers know. And they might have aimed and hoped to bring them down, not to implode them, but to bring them down sideways, make them fall over, which if, if they fall, they're both a quarter of a mile high. You could have, they could have hoped to kill 100,000 people in, in Manhattan, at Ru Russia, to early morning. That would have been the Dresden of the Taliban. It would not have been a Pearl Harbor at all. We're going to go back to calls, but very quickly, and this photograph is when the Twin Towers uh, were completed, and you, as you write, you first saw them back in the summer of 1970 when the World Trade Center was still under construction. Mm. Do you think they will or should they rebuild the World Trade Center? I would say that I, I'm, I'm one of those who thinks it would be a bad idea. Um, for one thing, I don't think it's possible to build on that site. I'm not a religious person. I, I don't believe particularly in the sacro sanctness of remains. I'm going to give my own carcass to science. I've already done so, in fact. Um, but I, I think everyone has a natural revulsion against um, 
desecration. And this is like Antigone. This is the, un, un, the unburied bodies that in the, more or less in the streets. I don't think you can build on that. Again. Next call from London for Christopher Hitchens. Thanks for taking my call, uh, Mr. Hitchens. Uh, I like your comments, especially your view and opinion on, uh, on India's uh, position in the world, uh, in the global economy today and in the global political scenario, especially your comment about secular, pluralistic, and democratic approach of India. As I, as I compare the status of Pakistan pre-September 11th, and now I would like your opinion, especially um, when uh, Pakistan used to be a vehement supporter of the Taliban and had diplomatic relations with the Taliban, was uh, state sponsoring terrorism. In fact, also calling uh, General Parvez Musharraf, the military dictator, calling some of the terrorists who've been banned by the Western world freedom fighters. And now in the last two months, as you compare the status of Pakistan where um, now uh, they are being showered with uh, military aid. 20 F-16 has just been reallocated to Pakistan, billion dollar aid package, while some of the fundamentals still stay the same. Yeah, I, I very much agree with you, and I've, I've, in my forthcoming piece in Vanity Fair, I, I rehearsed a lot of the same misgivings that I have about current US policy. I think it's far too indulgent to the Pakistani military oligarchy which is the problem in the first place. Mr. Bush, in his opening speech, said we will make no distinction, if you remember, between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and those who harbor and uh, harbor them. Well, this is more the Pakistani uh, military oligarchy and the Saudi Arabian ruling family have done much more than harbor Al-Qaeda and uh, the Taliban. They have sponsored, incubated, and uh, paid for, armed, helped, and trained them, and installed them, riveted them upon the, the luckless people of Afghanistan who, in the history of having had some very uh, uh, depressing governments, have never had anything as uh, horrifying as this. It's slavery, penury, beggary, uh, destitution. That's what they've done to the Afghan people. Think what they would do to us. So, I thought that, uh, I, th I thought and think that the, the, the dependence of the United States policy are not really owning up to that. Because we'd rather say we had Muslim friends than say what ought to be said about General Musharraf and the Saudis. In addition to... We become his... prisoners of our allies. And um, the fact of the matter is the Pakistani army is sabotaging the war against the Taliban. It doesn't want it to succeed. It openly says it doesn't want it to succeed, if you read what it says carefully. It wants to keep as much of its uh, Afghan assets as it can. It, it wants to hold on to a, a pliable quasi-Taliban regime, uh, I think, in uh, Kabul, in order that it retains strategic depth, as it calls it, for a confrontation with India, a holy war confrontation, as they call it, over Kashmir, into which they have introduced nuclear weapons. This is an unbelievably appalling ally to have. And I, as I say, I have, the, I have the strongest doubt that it is anything more than a very false friend in this battle. And I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was Not at all. plug the book again and I'll also mention oh, that please. our guest uh, also writes for Vanity Fair and The Nation magazine, and we have hyperlinked The Nation as part of C-SPAN's website if you want to log on and find out more about that publication. We'll get a call from Jensen Beach, Florida. Good morning. And you were going to wave the book then? And we'll wave the book again. <laughs> we're not doing it enough? Well, that was very nice. You said you were about to. So this is it. I didn't want to step on that line, promise. <laughs> Go ahead, caller. Oh, I'm, am I on? You I'm are. Sure. Uh, thank you, C-SPAN. Uh, Mr. Hitchens, Brian Lamb's not there this morning, so I have to ask you, are you still a socialist? Ah, it's, I, think, I think I say this in the book. Um, 20 years I've been doing this, the show, um, very nearly 20 years, since it, more or less since it started, and Brian always used to ask me this look of polite, right. polite incredulity, you know, um, you said you were a socialist, wow, you know, and then it became a habit, every time I came back on he'd say, well, by the way, I haven't checked lately, are you still, and every time I'd say, sure, I would never be pushed off position of principle like that, and I knew that one day he thought, I'll ask him and he'll say, no, I've rethought it, and then I started to think, I'm not going to give him the satisfaction. So it's probable, <clears throat> here we come to it, it's probable that I went on saying I was for slightly longer than I would have done if it wasn't for Brian Lamb. Um, or that maybe the Brian Lamb kept me a socialist long. I, I actually now, for various reasons I haven't got time for, I don't have a political allegiance any longer. Uh, I, don't, I don't have an ideological one either. I spent my entire life on the Marxist left, and I learned a lot from it. And if I could tell you so this, quite a lot about this is in the book, about what I learned and what I thought was worthwhile from it, and would still defend. But 
I, I now don't really think there is a socialist movement. Um, I don't think it's going to revive, if I'm really objective about it. Well, and, I don't, and, I don't think, and I don't think it exists as a platonic alternative either. So I, haven't, I don't take back everything I've ever said about capitalism by any means, but I now ask people, I ask of people, you know, what are their, what are their principles, not, not what are their politics. Question. Mm. Um, this uh, Islamic holy war, mm. uh, it's been said that it's an attack on, on Western culture. Isn't it really an attack on the global culture? Well, it, it, at first it's an attack on Islamic culture, which, um, from which the West, we, what we call Western civilization, is made up quite largely of contributions from the Muslim world, particularly the Arab Muslim world. To give, I mean, the most salient example would be most of the writing of the ancient Greek philosophers of 5th century Athens was completely lost uh, to the West for many centuries and was uh, substantially obliterated in, in many parts of Europe by Christianity, which didn't want it to be thought that there had been high wisdom and high ethics before the coming of uh, Jesus Christ. So those, but the, the works of the Greeks were preserved in um, great Muslim universities and libraries and came back to the West through, through Andalusia, through Spain. We owe them that. We, you try and do um, uh, thermodynamic calculations using Roman numerals and see where you uh, get, or any other kind of calculation. The, the, our numerals are from the Muslim world. Geneva, Switzerland. Just an example. Now, so wait, the, this is an, but that, the, the societies that did that the Muslim societies that allowed these tremendous achievements were open and, as you can see, were interested in things like the Greeks and things like uh, the Jews and things like the Jews, excuse me, in, in discussions with Judaism. Um, the Al-Qaeda Taliban ideology would make that kind of Muslim cultural life impossible. And remember, before they blew up the World Trade Center, they used heavy artillery to blow up the two big statues of Buddha in Bamiyan in Afghanistan. They mean business. They want total cultural erasure, obliteration of culture, science, free inquiry, separation of church and state, emancipation of women, all the things that make civilization possible. They, they are determined to destroy. That's an attack on the Muslim world. Go ahead, Geneva. Good morning. Good morning. I'm calling from Geneva. My question is to the speaker. Uh, we know, I heard somewhere, that uh, every Napoleon has his Waterloo, or every Wellington has his Waterloo. What I'm trying to say is, was the World Trade Center attack an entrapment by which Al-Qaeda called in Bush to enter their Waterloo, to enter their entrapment in Afghanistan? If I got the question right, I think the question is asking, was asking, was the, is this some kind of a trap? Is, was the was the hope that Bush, was the hope of the, the murderers, the fanatics, to entice President Bush to involve himself in Afghanistan? I don't think I don't think so. Um, but let's suppose it's true. I wouldn't think it was such a grave matter. I'll tell you why. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry for my throat this morning. In uh, June of this year, I was, I'm very proud to say, I was asked by a group of um, American and Afghan uh, female scholars if I would put my name on a petition to be circulated around Washington and elsewhere, um, demanding that the United States government uh, disown the Taliban as the government of Afghanistan, um, as it looked then, because the Taliban was a creation of our lovely Pakistani allies and their military secret police, the ISI. The United States had no real beef with the ta Taliban regime. We thought we should change that. Um, I still believe that uh, Mr. Bush is not sufficiently anti-Taliban. Um, I would instance the following. The Revolutionary Association of Women of Afghanistan, RAWA as it's called, R-A-W-A, has a real network of opposition and resistance in Kabul and Kandahar, civic opposition. They're able to get reporters in and out. A wonderful film, which you may have seen, called Behind the Veil, was made with their assistance. They're a real force. They've never been invited to any of these broad-based government meetings that you hear about from the administration. Why not? The Pakistani army doesn't like Rawa. And the Saudis don't want to see women uh, in meetings sponsored by the United States about a future government of Afghanistan. So 50% of the population is supposed to be kept out of the picture. So you, you hear the... the, the uh, the reporter saying another meeting today of the future broad-based government, and it's a narrow group of elderly, 
men in turbans who represent feudal clans and or the absurd claim of the exiled monarchy. Well, this is not good enough. So, um, you know, I, I think Bush should have been more anti-Taliban much earlier, and I hope he gets even more anti-Taliban very soon. Next call, Long Beach Island. Good morning. Oh, good morning to you guys. Uh, C-SPAN, A1 job, and so Mr. Hitchens. Um, I've got a little uh, question. You. I think that this all revolves around religion and uh, how that the uh, different religions of the world since the beginning of... Uh, of uh, the written word have impacted uh, our society and have, have uh, in, infused their uh, doctrine on us and taken apart our way of uh, thought that of free speaking individuals here in America. What do you feel about that, Mr. I think I, I think if you and I met, we probably found that we thought very much alike. Um, I'm, a large part of my book is an attack on faith. I mean, I think we, if people say I have faith, I'm, I'm, I don't know why they expect me to be impressed. What that means is that they rely on something they couldn't prove and can't defend an argument. They just say, it's so because I kind of believe it. I couldn't be less impressed. Um, civilization begins where, where reason kicks in and where there are, uh, there are no unexamined assumptions. Uh, where skepticism uh, occurs uh, and doubt and experiment begins is where science begins. Um, and medicine. Um, and any, anything else that's any good for you. Um, belief, the belief that you are the plaything of a creator, uh, that you attribute your presence here not to the laws of evolution and of biology and physics, but to some plan, is, I think, a horrible idea because um, I'm glad it's not true. Some atheists say they wish religion was true. It's just a shame it's not. I'm not one of those. I think it's a horrible scheme. Imagine the idea that you have cradle-to-grave supervision that also goes on after you're dead. You never get away with it. It's like living in a celestial North Korea. It's impossible to escape. It's, it's demanding that you be enslaved um, and uh, by a totalizing force. Well, I'm very, very glad that there's no reason to believe that such a force exists. Manchester, England, for Christopher Hitchens. Good morning. Yeah, hello, uh, Mr. Hitchens. Uh, I'd just like to, uh, your take on the Middle East. Uh, I'd like you to know what you think of uh, Ariel Sharon. I mean, he's been responsible for the uh, 1982 massacre of the Palestinians uh, in Sabra and Shatila. And uh, do you not think there is a... Uh, comparison between what the Israelis are doing today to the Palestinians in the occupied territories and to what the uh, uh, Nazis did to the uh, Jews back in uh, the sec Second World War? Uh, to answer your question in reverse, no to the last bit. I don't think it's remotely comparable. I don't think anyone who's studied um, the history of German imperial Nazi imperialism in the 30s and 40s in Europe uh, would, would recognize um, Israeli behavior in that unbelievable campaign to destroy Western civilization. Um, but you're hearing this said firmly, I hope, by someone who, who thinks that you just understated matters about Ariel Sharon. He wasn't just responsible for a massacre of thousands of unarmed civilians, and, and directly responsible. He instigated it um, in 1982. He's been responsible for massacres and, uh, and the bullying of, um, and killing of civilians all his life. Um, he's a religious thug, um, and one of the worst combinations imaginable, a religious nationalist. To combine, once you combine ethnicity with messianism, it doesn't matter which the religion is, you're going to have a nightmarish uh, result. I say this as someone of Jewish parentage, um, as someone who actually doesn't, thinks that Zionism is a false messiah for the Jews. Um, but we can't, let's not get into all that now. It's, it's certainly nothing but pain for the, for the Arabs of Palestine. And, um, I think their treatment is appalling. I think they should have had a state of their own a long time ago. Even the Balfour Declaration, which founds the moral conditions for the Zionist state, says that if th that the, the rights given to Jews in Palestine must be, uh, what's the word, matched uh, by the rights given to the, what is called rather contemptuously, the native population. Well, I certainly am not prepared to demand as a Jew that um, an Arab born in Palestine has, should have less rights there than I, born in Portsmouth, as it happens, should have. Um, indeed, I think it's very dubious that I should have the same rights as a Jew in Palestine as someone who was born there when I wasn't. So if you, get, if you, if you follow me, I, I therefore shorten this. I think, I think it is an absolute disgrace that a single cent of American taxpayers' money is allowed to be used by Israel for the occupation. I think that should stop immediately. I think that Sharon should be told, if you're going to occupy these people, 
and treat them like cattle and, and threaten to expel them again, to, to uh, ethnically cleanse them, which is, is now openly being this one. You do that on your own dime. You do not use a single American weapon or dollar for that. I also think he should be told to stop talking that way in any case. A couple minutes left with Christopher Hitchens. First, Charleston, South Carolina. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm um, a fellow Brit. Uh, I can tell. Absolutely. Uh, I think we're about the same age also. I'm just wondering... Uh, ah, what, what is that in your... Uh, I'm glad you asked and not me. I can't, I can't not ask. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, leave that open for speculation. often wonder how old I seem. Um, what, I, I just was wondering what you feel about the British role in this, that um, in the past generations we've done so much to inflame this region. Um, what, what, what do you feel that we possibly can do as rather a poor second-rate <laughs> nation today with Tony Oh, Blair? don't be so modest. Um, and also just, what did you study at Balliol? I studied philosophy, uh, politics and economics. Um, did I get that question quite right? Um, How would you size up Tony Blair? Oh, well, um, I don't come, even when I, I'm no longer a member of the Labour Party, but I, when I was, I, I was not on the same wing as the one that's produced him. But I um, very much admire the way he's handled himself recently. Um, I thought, I'll give you one, one example of what I mean. As you know, quite a lot of our fellow um, my fellow Englishmen and women were killed in that atrocity. Um, we don't know how many, uh, but it's quite a lot. Uh, more than has ever been killed by that kind of thing at one time before in, in say, Belfast or any of the other tussles. Blair has made almost nothing of this. He hasn't said we, has, in talking to the British public, at least the first few times, and when addressing the Labour Party conference, uh, the keynote speech, he didn't try and appeal to people saying, look, by the way, a lot of Brits were killed too, so it's our fight. He defined it quite correctly as something that quite transcends all ethnic, national, and other sorts of boundary. And I, I admire him for it. I also admire him for pressing on Mr. Bush the following. Mr. Bush cannot go around talking about defending civilization while saying, by the way, we don't think this cause of civilization is good enough to actually risk an American soldier in. Can't we hire some local mercenaries to do the dying for us? Or can't we have pilots flying so high that their planes can't be seen or heard from the ground, which pretty much guarantees there will be bad bombings on the ground, Miss, bad near misses and, and well, I don't mean near misses, I mean collateral damage. Um, Tony Blair says no, and the SAS people are saying, we, know, we, should, we should have already established a fire base right in the middle of Taliban territory. I told them, we're in your grid square, as the British like to point. What are you going to do about that? Uh, that would put the fear of the living God into them, if anything would. Okay. So, I mean, I, I, no, I take my hat off to Blair, really. London, go ahead, please. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Uh, Mr. Hitchens, I'm a big fan, although I may not always agree with Why you. Why doesn't someone who hates me call up? <laughs> we will. It's been fan, fan, fan all day. <laughs> we will. I'm supposed it's to be your here. Morning. I'm supposed to be here selling a book on how to be a contrarian. <laughs> well, we may well, all be being love bombed all the time. It's nauseating. But um, my question is, is that uh, you have advocated the establishment of closer relationship with India. Mm. The BJP government of India has come to power by fanning Hindu fanaticism. Mm. Christians are being killed in that country. Mm -hmm. Indian brutality in Kashmir has gone widely unreported. India has fought wars with most of its neighbors or interfered in the internal affairs of most of its neighbors, like Sri Lanka, where it has supported the Tamil Tigers. India even opposed the UN resolution on East Timor. India opposes the Kashmiri people in having a say where Kashmir should go to either Pakistan or as an independent Kashmiri state. Yeah, I know where, I know where you're going and I see where you're coming from. Some of that is true. I'm certainly not a fan of the BJP government. By um, the arrogant claims made by Muslim extremists, you know, these religious wars feed off each other's uh, mad theologies. Um, it's uh, also true, I must say, that I, I'm can't, I can't seem happy with the Indian policy in Kashmir. My, my feeling of friendship for India and Indians comes from this. When you're there, you realize that, okay, the BJP is in power now. It won't be in power all the time. It isn't in power in many of the states that make up India. It's not in power in, um, in West Bengal. It's not in power in Kerala. It's not in power in a number of other places. India is pluralistic. It has a secular constitution. It has seats in its parliament for 
all minorities. Um, it has um, uh, extraordinary achievement, I think, of, of combining democracy, secularism, and pluralism. Great strain, but well worth defending. And I think if it was to make more friends, uh, the, the odds are that that end of the scale would go up. Is that where I wanted to go? Yes, up. And the other end of the scale would go down, the, 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 the more uh, depressing things that you mentioned. On Kashmir, listen, no Indian is completely happy with the way that Kashmir is governed, but it is the fact that in 1977 there was an election in Kashmir. It was endorsed by Sheikh Abdullah, the leader of the uh, Muslims of Kashmir, the charismatic leader of Islam, in, 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 and it did not vote for Pakistan. Um, so I don't believe that, I don't believe it would if there was another election. But in the meantime, Pakistan has absolutely no right to be arming and training and dispatching across the border. The forces of Mr. Bin Laden, who nearly blew up the parliament the other day, killing a lot of people in the attempt, and who throw acid in the faces of Indian women telling them to adopt the veil. Not having any of that. Los Angeles for Christopher Hitchens. Good morning. Great. Uh... Uh, like your type of argument, you basically have intellectual discussion instead of uh, a screaming argument. Mm. I'm, a, I'm a libertarian, I'm basically I on the opposite side of the spectrum as you. But uh, I wonder if you could clarify a couple things for me. I believe Palestine was the entire area covering Israel and Jordan. I wonder if you could tell me at what point the Palestinians went to Jordan, and I realized they were kicked out when they blew up some passenger jets or something. And... Uh, I, do you, are you familiar with that? Uh, yes, I think more than you are, um, by the sound of it. Um, I'm not sure, I, I don't, th well, go ahead. Basically revolved around the Palestinians that were from Israel. I don't understand if the, uh, there's 22 Arab states, why they have to take over Israel. Uh-huh. Um, well, there are 49 American states. If someone told you you couldn't, apart from the one you're sitting in, if someone told you actually we would rather have your bit of Los Angeles for ourselves, from now on, this will only be, this. you can only be a landholder or a householder here if you profess the, let's say, Muslim or Buddhist faith. Otherwise, get out. This bit's ours. You're happy to go to Colorado on that basis. I don't think so. And I think if you think about it, you wouldn't insult anyone else uh, by um, treating them, their society or their country as, as disposable as that. The Palestinians do not feel uh, that God gave the land to someone else and they therefore have to be flung out. And I completely agree with them. Uh, they've, they've every right to resist that ridiculous proposal. Our last by the way, could I just say though, if you, if you say you're a libertarian, though I must say you sound like an authoritarian where Palestinians are concerned, if you are a libertarian you may find some nourishment in my book where I say that in the same breath as I as I mourn the decay of some of my socialist allegiances, that deep down, I mean, I've, I've always been a sympathizer of the libertarian anti-statist point of view, and one of the things that attracted me to socialism in the beginning was the idea of the withering away of the state. Anyway, you might get some amusement out of it. Keeps coming back to the book. Mm -hmm. You figure well, out you a know. way to promote it. This is America on message. Last call from Leeds, England, for Christopher Hitchens. We have about a minute left. Go ahead, please. Call Hello, Mr. Hitchens. Um, I'm another big fan of your work. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> I read a brief serialization of your, your novel in The Guardian yesterday. It read like a novel, did it? That's nice. It's the same book. Uh, wrong word. I apologize. No. But um, do you still have hope in the face of all this religious intolerance, which I see on a local basis, living among Muslim communities, young Muslim youth, and then on a global reach, there's a lot of religious intolerance. And it's very easy to portray that as coming from the Islamic side of the world, although obviously it's both sides. Do you still have hope? Does this not feel like a clash of civilizations? My view about that is it, it isn't a clash of civilizations, no, uh, because there's too much civilization on what uh, other people would otherwise call the other side, the Muslim side. But there is there's a, there's a very big clash of world views, and um, it's a fight which I personally think is it's absolutely essential to have. It's, look, the alternative of not fighting it does not exist. You can't surrender to theocratic fascism, nor could you live or coexist with it. Uh, so that's easy. And if it's, since they make it a choice, them or us, it'll be them. We'll make absolutely sure of it. This is what the book looks like, Letters to a Young Contrarian. The author is Christopher Hitchens. What's your next project? Um, 
In the year 2003, it will be the centennial of George Orwell, the centennial of George Orwell's birth. And I've written a book which will come out in the middle of next year, um, saying why I think he was uh, the, one of the most important writers of the 20th century and should be, should be uh, honored again. So I think it's, we haven't got a title yet, but provisionally it's called uh, The Victory of George Orwell. We thank you for joining us. Come back again. It was a pleasure. Thank you. By the way, C-SPAN made a mistake, and we want to correct it uh, in our coverage of the UN General Assembly, which, by the way, was originally scheduled to meet in late September, postponed because of the events of September the 11th, and meeting uh, throughout the next week. We had misidentified one of the speakers. Uh, it was South Korean Prime Minister Lee Han Dong. We had uh, identified him as the North Korean Prime Minister. He, of course, is the South Korean Prime Minister. We apologize for that mistake, and we thank our audience uh, for letting us know about that. Speaking of C-SPAN coverage of the event, in New York City and on this Veterans Day here in Washington at Arlington National Cemetery. Vice President Dick Cheney will be among the speakers. Our live coverage will get underway in about 25 minutes with the musical interlude and the remarks getting underway at 11 o'clock. President Bush is at the site of the World Trade Center for a ceremony that will take place this afternoon at 1.30 East Coast time, 10.30 for those of you in the West Coast, and we'll have live coverage of that again here on C-SPAN. Don't forget to check out American Politics tonight, which will include Carl Rove, who spoke to a, a conservative group here here this past Thursday and Senator Joe Lieberman who was up in Manchester New Hampshire speaking to New Hampshire Democrats that's American politics and book notes the topic tonight is a new book Roosevelt's secret war followed by Prime Minister's Questions, which is seen tonight at 9 Eastern, 6 o'clock for those of you in the West Coast. And Peter Bergen, who is out with a book called Holy War Incorporated, will be here tomorrow morning to take your calls. His book, by the way, is previewed in the Washington Post book section today. And uh, a reminder on C-SPAN 2. It was a serialized in Vanity Fair this week. It is? Yep. Thank you. Great book. Great, a great issue of the magazine, too. The book, uh, that's okay, <laughs> Judith Miller's book, Germs, Biological Weapons and America's Secret War. You can watch her tonight at 7.30 Eastern Time. She is in New York at the 92nd Street Y, all part of C-SPAN's book TV coverage. We thank you for joining us on this Veterans Day. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Sunday night on C-SPAN begins with American politics.